Okay. Um, the topic we are studying is uh, about Jesus. Who is Jesus? As I said, if some of you have missed on this topic, please go back to the YouTube channel, Pastor Mohan Rava Padasri, and go through all of them. Then only you will have a good, clear, comprehensive understanding. We also looked at objections, why people think he is not God. Then uh, we also looked at evidence as to why he is God. And last time we met, we looked at Jesus, if, if he is fully God and fully man about his nature. And today is very important. We will look at did Jesus possess, possess fallen human nature or unfallen human nature? And in other words, did he have any advantage over our nature? Just like me or did he have any advantage? We will look at that. So this will be the today's study. Um, there are five possible uh, answers to Jesus' human nature. What what actually they think he is. Some people think he had a pre-fall human nature. That means how Adam was before he sinned, when God created, what kind of nature Adam had. Maybe Jesus had the same nature. The second possibility in the Christian theological world is, no, he had a post-fall human nature. That means he was just like you and me. He didn't have... He didn't have Adam's pre-fall nature. He had Adam's post-fall nature, they think. Another possible answer they come up with is, um, he was made in the likeness of the sinful flesh, but not in the likeness of the sinful mind. I think this is playing up with words. He had a sinful flesh. That means his body, his flesh is sinful, but his mind is not sinful. Therefore, he was not able to sin, something like that. That's another answer that people come up with. Then he came in the flesh, but he was not exempt from the inherited passions and pollutions that corrupt the natural descendants of Adam. That means he is in the flesh, but he was exempt. Sorry, he was not, I didn't mean not, not. He was exempt. That means he's like one of us, but he had an exemption, you know. Some people have some exemptions, isn't it? Politicians can drive in any lanes or ambulance can go at any speed. And there are some exemptions for certain kinds of things. So some people think that Jesus had an exemption over inherited or pollutions that corrupt the nature of humanity. That's a fourth possible answer. And there's another thought is Christ was neither exactly like Adam before the fall nor exactly like us after the fall. He was very special. He's different to any one of us. What do you think is the correct answer? Now, this is how people try to come up with what kind of nature Jesus had. He's like me. Now, let's look at and see what we can actually find from the scripture itself. Now, first two, pre-fall, post-fall, we will discuss them at the end. That's why I'm starting with the third here. The third possibility, what does it say? He had a sinful flesh, but not sinful mind. Because his mind is not sinful, that's why he could not be tempted or he, was not, he did not sin. But the flesh is just like you and me. Now, he was made in the likeness of the sinful flesh, not in the likeness of the sinful mind. Do not drag his mind into it. That's what people say. If he had taken our mind, how can he exhort us? If he had taken our mind, I'm sorry, I think it should be, if he had not taken our mind, how can he exhort us? Let this mind be in you as it was in Jesus. Yeah. Let me quickly correct if, if he had not. Yeah, if he had not taken our mind, how can he exhort us? Let this mind be in you as it was in Jesus, isn't it? Paul was admonishing we should have the mind of Jesus. If his mind was different from me, how will I have his mind? But isn't my mind a part of my sinful, fallen human nature? 
And isn't it my mind that controls my whole body? Isn't the mind the battleground on which we encounter the evil one? Wouldn't all of us have appreciated being born with a special mind such as Christ? So people who believe that Jesus' mind was different to ours. Now, this is, this is how we can argue. If that is the case, then I wish I had his mind. Paul is saying we must all have his mind, but we don't have his mind. Because his mind is special that it cannot sin. Um, that's one. So do you think that's correct? I don't think so. This this possibility is not, it doesn't have biblical evidence. Now, the fourth possibility is what? Uh, it says, human flesh, but exempted from like passions. He has a flesh like you and me, but he is exempted from passions that we go through in our lives. It could be sinful passions, whatever it could be. If that's the case, look at some of the Bible verses. For such a high priest was fitting for us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners and has become higher than the heavens. Now, looking at the text on its own, it, it seems to suggest he's separate from sinners. He's not one of us. He's harmless. He's undefiled. He's holy. And he is higher than the heavens. So how is that? So he came into humanity, not by natural generation, but by a miracle. His birth was supernatural. God has his father, all the born in the flesh. He was nevertheless God and was exempt from the inherited passions and pollutions that corrupt the natural descendants of Adam. John 14, 30 says, I will no longer talk with much with you for the ruler of this world is coming and he has nothing in me. What does that mean? There was nothing in him that responded to the evil one. No matter what the devil will do, he can't get over Jesus because he is exempt from human passions. He may have a flesh like you and me, but he's exempt from human passions. He's undefiled, he's holy, he's harmless, he's separated from sinners, as the Hebrew writer says, and Jesus himself says, what is it? I will no longer talk much with you for the ruler of this world is coming and he has nothing in me. There was not, okay, though sinless in his life and in his nature, he was nevertheless in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin, like Hebrews 4.15 says, he was tempted like us, but he is without sin. So, which means maybe he's exempted to be like us. This is how it says. Now, is that true? It can't be. If it can be, then I think we have lost it. There are objections to this kind of understanding because if Christ has been exempted from passions, he would have been unable to understand or help mankind. He doesn't, he doesn't understand my struggles because he never experienced them. One who has never struggled with passions can have no understanding of their power, nor has he ever had the joy of overcoming them. If God extended special favors and exemptions to Christ in that very act, he disqualified him for his work, isn't it? You can't come to save me and want to live like me, but you're exempt from my kind of life. So it can be. If the men with whom he associated had understood that he was exempt from the passions with which they had to battle, his influence would immediately have been destroyed and he would be reckoned a deceiver, isn't it? Hiding from the, uh, hiding from the human temptations. His pronouncement, what did he say? I have overcome the world. That's what he said, isn't it? Would be accepted as a dishonest boast. For without passions, he had nothing to overcome, isn't it? If you're exempt from sin and temptations, what have you overcome then? So how can he say, I have overcome, if he is not tempted like you and me and overcame? So even this fourth possibility is not biblically acceptable. I hope you're following, yeah? Now the fifth possibility, what does it say? Neither pre-fall nor 
po post fall nature, but he is special, unique. You can't describe the pre fall nature of Adam, neither the post fall nature of Adam. He is very special. He is not like one of us. You think that's correct then? No. Now, Christ was neither exactly like Adam before the fall nor exactly like us. He was unique. That's the claim of this possibility. Was Christ unique? He came not merely to set us an example but to be our savior. If he were altogether like us, 100%, and if he had shared in exactly the same way the inheritance of sin and guilt as well received from Adam, then he would himself have stood in need of a redeemer, isn't it? If he was different, if uh, this is what they think. If he is a sinner like you and me, then he needed a savior. You as a sinner, I as a sinner, we need a savior to save. If he was a sinner like you and me, then he needed a savior. He can't save himself. He needed a savior. So that's a valid point, isn't it? So therefore, he is special. He is unique. That's what the argument they have. The ancient economy appointed priests who needed to contend with their own weakness. But God appointed Jesus who has been made perfect forever. Jesus came as a real human being, a human being in every essential sense of the word. One with us, but not one of us. In all things like unto us, sin only, experiential or inherited, accepted to be for us a savior and example. He was, Bible says, in all way, in all, he, in all ways he was tempted and yet without sin. So, do you think this is correct? No. If he is special, then he cannot be my savior. Now, let's quickly look at the, the first two possibilities. Possibility one, which says Jesus actually had what? Adam's pre-fall nature. That means Jesus, when he took upon human self, he had pre-fall. How was Adam before he sinned? He was sinless. He was perfect, isn't it? There was no inherited sin. Okay. Pre-fall nature. Adam's human nature before his fall. That is one, friends. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, 45. And so it is written, the first Adam. There's people waiting. Um, 1 Corinthians 15, 45, the first Adam became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Another text says, for since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as Adam, as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. Now, Romans 5.12, therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. For if by one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. Now, this is comparing the life of Jesus with Adam, uh, with his fall. Now, what created sinless. Was Adam created sinless? Yes, when he sinned, there was no, when he created, there was no, no original sin. Did Adam have any original sin when he was created? We are talking about the pre-fall nature. No, he didn't have any original sin. No inherited sin. Did he inherit any sin in his birth or in his creation? No, he didn't have any inherited sin. Born without sin, but with propensity to sin. Isn't that right? He was born without sin. He was created sinless. He had no original sin. He did not inherit any sin. But So he was born without sin, but not without sin propensity to sin. He had the propensity to sin. How do we know? By the stories we know. How 
he was created with the freedom of choice. He can choose to if he wants to. How do we know that? Because he sinned. You cannot sin if you are not uh, created with the power of choice or created with the propensity to sin. Christ's sinless nature resulted from his being born with the unfallen nature of Adam. I want you to get this here. Jesus Christ's sinlessness resulted from his being born with the unfallen nature of Adam. Adam's nature before fall was sinless in creation. He did not have any original sin, neither did he inherit original sin. And yet he had the capacity to sin and he did exercise that and unfortunately fell into sin. Christ also was sinless. His sinlessness resulted from being born with what? Unfallen nature of Adam. This is the argument. Now, while first Adam fell, the second Adam gained victory, according to scriptures. Now, what is the problem with this kind of an understanding? If this is how we think Jesus' nature is, so there are some difficulties we have to come across. There is no way for us to participate in the unfallen experience of Adam, isn't it? All of us were born in sin after the fall. We really cannot experience or even comprehend what it means to live in an unfallen, sinless nature that was there pre-fall. Since he had no victory over sin in our fallen nature, he could not share it with us. Therefore, it is impossible to overcome as Christ overcame. If Jesus had unfallen human nature or Adam's pre-fall nature, he, what does it say? He could not share it with us. Jesus cannot share it with us because his nature is different to us. Therefore, it is impossible to overcome as Christ overcame. He overcame because he had an unfallen nature. I cannot overcome sin because I have a fallen nature. So how easy my example then? So I hope that is clear. So is, did he have a pre-fall human nature? I think we could say no, not necessarily. You can see some elements of it, but not entirely. The last possible answer is Adam's human nature after his fall. Jesus had nature of man, Adam, after his fall. Is that correct? Hebrews 2.16 says, For indeed he does not give aid to angels, but he does not give aid to the sea. Uh, he does give, sorry, why am I using? He does give aid to the seed of Abraham, talking about Jesus. The seed of Abraham. What kind of nature did the seed of Abraham have? Pre-fall Adam nature or post-fall? It's post-fall. The seed of Abraham had sin weakened bodies and minds, so did he. This does not involve guilt. To be subjective to sin is not to be guilty of it. I want us to get this statement because this helps us to see Jesus more clearly. The, uh, when, when a child sins, they're, they're born in sin in the weakened bodies and minds, but do they, do they have a sin? In, are they guilty of any sin? Of their own? No, that's what the children are. They are no guilty of any sin. So to be subjective to sin doesn't mean that you're guilty of it. We are born in sin. If Bible says, if any man says he has no sin, he is what? A liar. That's what the scripture says. So to be subjective to sin means we are born in sin. So in one way or the other, we are in that sense we are set but i'm not guilty of a sin just like how a newborn child is subject to sin but not guilty of sin at that point or <coughs> sorry sin hebrews 2 17 therefore in all things he had to be tempted like his brethren that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to god to make propensiation for the sins of the people. Romans 1.3, concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David, according to the flesh. Paul says, Jesus was born. 
into the seed of David, not according to the spirit, but according to the flesh, which means he had nature just like you and me. Jesus, like all others, inherited the nature of David after the flesh, but he did not yield to the inherent weakness of that nature. In this flesh, there is an inherent weakness that have we acquired by sin. Just because I have this inherent weak nature, which I have because of sin, doesn't mean that I'm guilty of that sin until I fall into sin. I hope I'm making sense. So if you're unclear, we will have, we'll take some questions later. But that's what this is talking about. So, for example, in as much then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same that through death he might destroy him who had power of death, that is the devil. So he had his nature is just like you and me. Adam did not know any birth or ancestry, isn't it? But Adam did not have battles to fight against hereditary tendencies. He had the power in himself to choose always not to sin. Before this is uh, in his pre-fall nature. Inherited sinful, that is carnal nature. Nature itself is sinful by inheritance. Because, for example, as I said of a child, I was born to my mother. My mother was a sinful woman. She did not pass on to me her sins. She passed on to me or my parents passed on to me not their sins but their nature to sin inherited sinful nature not their particular individual sins so i'm not guilty of my parents sins but i'm but i carry the nature of my parents for the propensity to sin because i carry that sinful nature what about jesus born in sin but not with sin and had propensity to sin. He was born in sin, but not with sin, just like how a newborn baby is. But had he had the propensity to sin? Yes. If not, he cannot be able to set a good exam. Jesus came to be our savior. So what if so what if it turned out that he had an advantage? Who but the devil should care about that? Do you understand this statement? Understand this. But Jesus did. But did Jesus really have an advantage over my nature? What do you think? Yes or no? Answer is no. He didn't have an advantage. Otherwise, he can't be my example. I have never been tempted. For instance, I want you to look at this statement. I have never been tempted, for instance, to use my divine power to extricate myself from difficulty because. I have none. Look at the challenges Jesus had. The kind of temptation he had, none of us would go through because he had power as a divine person. But yet to control, to be able to hold on, not to use it is the biggest temptation. Imagine you have power to do something and you are in trouble and you don't use it. That's the biggest temptation. And yet Jesus was able to overcome. So, but Christ had to meet that temptation how many times? It's daily to be able to have it and not to use it. And he felt it keenly because every day he was troubled. Um. We are tainted with sin, but he was not. This was not an advantage for him. For example, new car. Maybe you should, we should, one author actually put that as an example. But I, 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 I would, uh, I use a newborn baby. But anyway, look at what he says. This is a. This is from the book, The Nature of Christ by Roy Adams, one of our Adventist scholar. It was with the tension of a person with a brand new car, so to speak that Christ had to live every second of this earthly life. The faintest scratch, the slightest dent would scuttle his entire mission. Can you imagine? Just like a brand new car, a small scratch would not be would disqualified to be a brand new car. 
because it has a scratch. Now, the problem with Jesus is not just sin, but even a slightest dent in whatever he did would jeopardize the entire mission. He would like, how would you like to go through life with the conscience that a single misstep on your part would imperil the salvation of the whole human race. If you were in that position, carrying that big burden, that even a slightest sin, even in thought, would jeopardize the salvation of the entire human race. Can you imagine what kind of a weight he carried to live every moment of his life without sin? We can't even comprehend what that means. But that is what precisely Christ's lot was. He did it for us. Now, the, uh, maybe some other time we could look at the difference between sin in capital versus sin. Just to give a bit of example. Did Eve sin when she took the fruit or before she took the fruit? The answer is, in both we can say. But the question is, she took the she, before even she took the fruit, what happened to her head and her heart? She rejected the word of God and his will and replaced it with her own wisdom and will. So she already sinned before she has taken the fruit. That what do we call so? So Eve committed sin. Look at the difference here. This is capital. Eve committed sin before the action. Before she did the action, she already committed sin because she loved herself and her desire more than she loved God and his will. This is the core of sin. So in other words, even before you commit the act of sin, there is a possibility for you to sin. Jesus gives examples. For example, lust. If you look at a woman lustfully, you have sinned. You haven't committed an action of adultery, but the temptation even to... To go to that far, Jesus called it as a sin. Now, Eve, when she decided to disobey God, even before she touched the fruit, she sinned. That's what is, we, we, we one author, uh, this is Roy Adams actually puts it in the capital. Sin, is, sin in the heart gives birth to sinful action. In other words, the intention to sin, the, the sin, the, uh, the, the propensity to sin, for you to yield to the temptation even in your mind actually gives birth to an action which we call sin. Her act of eating the fruit is not the sin, but the result of sin already ruling in her heart. So what she did was actually the result of the sin that she intended to do even before she acted upon it. So... What are we saying? One does not need to be sinful to be tempted. Adam and Eve were not sinful to be tempted, but they had the propensity to sin. Therefore, they, they not only were tempted, they yielded to the temptation. Jesus was born just like you and me with the propensity to sin. Was he tempted like you and me? The scripture clearly says he was tempted like us. While Adam fell, Jesus chose not to fall. For example, one does not have to be sinful in order to be tempted. One need not have sinful passions or propensities in order to be tempted. The only prerequisite for genuine temptation to occur is that the subject have the capacity to sin. While, why else would Satan have struggled so hard and so persistently with him? What does that mean? When Jesus was upon this earth, he was, the devil was physical. The devil was literally was tempting Jesus on that 40, after the 40 days of fasting. If the devil knew or if the devil had that understanding that Jesus has advantage over human flesh, then there's no way he could tempt Christ. The devil very well knew that Jesus is in human flesh just like any other human and he had all the possibilities to sin. That's why he tried his best to put Jesus to sin. Had Jesus, had Satan knew that his nature is different to us, there's no way he could do anything to him. He wouldn't waste his time with Jesus. If Christ could not sin, then the whole purpose of his coming would have been compromised. What's the point? 
So how was he able to live a sinless life then? If he was just like you and me with the propensity to sin. He was sinful by nature but not guilty of any sin by his own act. I hope you understand that one. How was he able to? Because there's no man on this planet earth who ever lived a complete sinless life. How was he able to live then? John 8, 28, then Jesus said to them, when you lift up the son of man, then you will know that I am he and that I do nothing of myself. But as my father taught me, I will speak these things. When you're intentionally living with a purpose and all that you do is not what your flesh is saying, but what your spirit and what you are asked to do, there is a possibility not to sin. Some of us are weak in some areas. Some of us are strong in some areas. There's nothing, certain things, no matter how much temptation comes around you, you won't be tempted. No matter how the pressure is, you will not give up because your mind is not on it and nothing can tempt you. I'm sure some of us can say those things. Talking about myself, for example, drink. I've never drank. Even if you put me among thousand drunkards and give me a bottle, it doesn't tempt me at all. Even if I'm hungry, it doesn't tempt me. That one thing I'm very confident because I've made up my mind never to taste wine in ever whatever form it is. What does this text say? Jesus decided that he will do nothing of himself. One of the reasons why we fall into sin is we want to feed the flesh of the desires it brings out of its nature. But Jesus chose not to feed the flesh with the desires and the temptations that attacked him because his focus was not to do anything of himself but follow the will of his father. He did not exercise his divine power to save himself from the weaknesses and temptations inherited from his human ancestry. Did he use any of his divine uh, strength to overcome sin? If he would have used it, then he would be disqualified to be my savior. How do we know that he did not use his divine power? Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. Satan knew Jesus had the power of the deity to work miracles, isn't it? The devil knew that he had the power because he was God at the same time. He, so he was trying to put him down at that level. If Jesus had failed to overcome the tempter in the same nature we have, and by the same means available to us, the devil would have proven that obedience to is indeed an impossible requirement. If Jesus would have fallen, then it was a sure guaranteed evidence that nobody can keep the law. That's why Jesus imagined to face those three simple death temptations, 40 days and 40 nights he has to fast and pray because his eyes were focused not on the gratification of self, even for a slightest moment, even in thought, but to fulfill for the mission that God has sent him. Satan very well understood that Jesus could not use his divine power to save himself and to save man at the same time. This is what made the test such a severe and agonizing experience for Christ. So, what are we saying? Can we equal the perfect pattern of Jesus' sinless life? Well, if Jesus had the nature like me, propensity to sin like me, and yet choose not to sin, because he chose to live the life that his God ordained for him every moment of his life. So does that mean, I can I also live like Christ, a sinless life? Is that possible? Well, the answer is no. The answer is no. Why? All of us have degraded human nature further by giving way to the flesh. Not only have we brought the curse of death upon ourselves, but by, by breaking God's law, but we, also be, but we have also made ourselves more vulnerable, vulnerable to Satan by cooperating with him in many ways. I want us to know, 
uh, the, the, sometimes it could mean, well, the answer could be yes, otherwise what's the point? But I want us to see a deeper thought here. Can we equal the perfect pattern of Jesus' sinless life? It, the answer has to be no, because if you lead a sinless life, then you don't need a savior. Jesus said, I came to save who? Sinners, not those righteous. Jesus never responded to a single stimulus and Satan could find nothing in him. He lived all his life with the surrendered mind and will of the fully sanctified. He committed no sin to be atoned for. Well, if we can't live life of Jesus Christ, then what's the point? No, that's what, that's the main point. Because we can't live, maybe I I'm going a bit ahead. Even though we cannot equal the pattern of Jesus' sinless life, we can earnestly seek to reflect his life with the help of the Holy Spirit. Now, Romans 8, 3 and 4. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirements of the law must be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. I want you to know, we just say, oh, Jesus came to die for me and save me from sin. That is true. But, but the deeper thing is that Jesus came to defeat sin and the results of sin, which is death. How did he do it? By living a perfect life. Because you and I cannot, not that we cannot do it. He has to do it so that the sin can be killed in the flesh. When you have time, please speak, read that chapter. It's an amazing chapter. Righteousness by faith, what does it mean? It is the imputing. That means, imputing means to assign, to attribute, to give credit. What God does in his, I can't do it for myself. God is doing it in me. That's what is called impute righteousness. And imparting means what God does for us of the results of his sinless life and atoning death. The purpose of the incarnation was to redeem fallen man and not sinless man. That's what I said. God has come to save sinners and there is no one on earth who is sinless. Sin in the flesh can only be condemned in a sinless flesh. That is Jesus Christ. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. He knew there is nothing he could save himself. He also says what? When Paul also says we are baptized. When we baptize, what are we doing? We are baptizing into his death so that we could have his life over me. So Paul also says the life I live is not mine but Christ's. Because it, Paul also says the things that I don't want to do, I keep doing. The things I want to do, I keep not doing. Then he says, who will save this wretched body? Isn't it? You remember that great amazing verses? Then he says, I'm crucified with Christ. So my little children, so what? If we can't live a sinless life, is there a hope for me? Yes. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. God expects us not to sin. But if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation. That means atonement for our sins. And not for us only, but also to the whole world. So what does that mean? When I sin, I, I, I can choose not to sin. But if I sin, and when I sin, I have Jesus who died for my sins and he covers me with his righteousness. That's why when I stand on the judgment day in front of the Father, the judge of all human race, I stand not with my merits, but with the merits of Jesus Christ. Because if I stand on my own merits, I can't even stand. It was Christ's death on the cross. It's Christ's righteousness covering me that qualifies me to be accepted into that eternal home. So the question now, that, did Jesus have pre-fall or post-fall nature? What do you think? Like, <laughs> this is how I want to conclude. Does it really matter? For those brilliant minds who want to argue for everything, yes. We are so much prone to use the post-fall nature. 
he was born with an inherited sin but not guilty of any of his sin just like how a newborn baby is does it matter for some it matters some it may not sin is possible in both natures isn't it was sin possible in free fall nature yes adam had a pre fall sinless he was created sinless he never had an inherited sin and yet he sinned is sin possible in a post fall nature we all are a, we all are perfect examples of that so when sin is possible in both the natures what is so great in discussing what nature he has because if it is before or after sin has the the nature has the propensity to sin because it is possible sin can be overcome in both natures in the power of god that's the beauty of it it's not what nature you have that is more important right now but do you have the power to overcome sin yes not in our own strength but with the strength of christ for we can overcome like how he overcame jesus whether in pre fall nature or post fall nature overcame sin not by the divine power but by completely in the flesh with the power of god i want you to get this comparison here jesus never used his divinity to overcome temptation or fall uh, any other thing he used he completely relied on god to overcome sin now for us we can also overcome sin not with our own strength but with the power of god if we fall that's why we read we have jesus christ who can cover us with his righteousness and cleanses he gives us the same power to overcome sin if we live in his merits and obedience to his will like how jesus obeyed the will of the father if he choose to we can also live the life that christ lived when i am crucified with chris christ it is no longer i live but christ lives in me these are the words of paul if christ lives in you then you will not fall tempted we do not fall to sin so what's the conclusion christ did have the capacity to sin his temptations were real he did not have the advantage over us so far as the temptations are concerned his temptations are more intense and stronger because even in thought had he sinned we would have lost the plot so he had more temptations he overcame temptations in the same way that is open to all of us through god's inexhaustible power available through the holy spirit his victory is our victory he overcame and when i fall he becomes my victory when i look up to him we are saved by his victory we need to accept his victory as our victory we are not saved by trying to duplicate his victory instead we are saved by accepting his victory as our own he saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness but according to his mercy we seek personal victory not in order to be saved but because of the insatiable desire born of profound gratitude to be like him who has saved us every time you overcome a temptation you are not putting any credit for your salvation there no don't to ever say because i don't smoke i don't drink this i don't do that i don't do that i am sure to go to heaven no because we are saved we long to do the will of god our acts of sinlessness and uh, avoiding temptation is not for salvation but they are a fruit of salvation showing us that we are indeed saved by the death of jesus christ on the cross for us so we don't do any good work to save we do good works because we are saved and we want to show our gratitude to god by obeying his will that's the uh, conclusion next time we will start a new new uh, topic the personality and the deity of the holy spirit which is again one of the most debated topics on god godhead so hopefully we will start that and uh, i'm not sure how many sessions but i'm guessing at least four to five sessions with that when we finish that we would have covered entirely on does god exist is jesus god is the holy spirit god and that would help us to even understand better 
now let me stop recording <laughs>